Father in heaven, we thank you for your dear son, the Lord, the King of Kings. We pray, Father, that uh, from whatever vantage point we come to this word, whether we're in a relationship with you or whether we're um, outsiders considering uh, the claims of Christ and inquiring, that you would give us collectively soft hearts and receptive ears to what you have to say in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, fear is a really underrated emotion, do you not think? It's true, fear has been used to manipulate, but without fear, you'll die. Fear is a good thing. Every parent wants to inject fear in their kids' hearts when it comes to cars and running across highways and roads, because a child that does not have a fear of cars and roads will end up sooner or later dying. Now, those ads on TV that we're all so familiar with, you know, where the warning is, don't drink and drive, don't text and drive. How are we going on that, by the way? Keeping our vows? Come on, guys. We've made progress. I'm really chuffed. <laughs> you know, stop, revive, survive. And then with the, warn with the encouragement comes the warnings. You know, pictures, graphic pictures of cars split in two with trucks, uh, cars with couples in it rolling over and bodies falling out, images of uh, a man, an older brother, protecting his younger brother as a car slams into the tree, uh, images of um, emergency wards with blood on the floor, and you think, whew, there's a lot of motivation of fear here and no one's complaining. And the reason is because fear is only manipulative when there's no basis to it. Um, for example, billions, maybe a billion human beings on the face of this earth live in fear of their dead ancestors. It's probably not most of your worlds, but it is the world of some of us here. And they sacrifice and do homage and do things to grant favour of ancient ancestors who have passed for fear that they will come back and curse. Now, there's absolutely no basis to that fear. I never give my ancestors a thought, and they haven't done me any harm. We so often fear the wrong things. Our fear is misplaced. Last, uh, we heard recently of another shark attack, uh, a fatal shark attack in Tathra. You know, there are basically, since records were kept over the last 200 years, about 220 fatal shark attacks in Australia. Did you know, and you probably do, that there are 10 times more deaths due to suicides in one year in Australia? 10 times more. 2,000 plus compared to the 200 over 200 years. 10 times more fatal car accidents in Australia than there are compared to the 200 over 220 over 200 years. No, no. The thing to fear is not a tiger shark. The thing to fear most is actually you and your car and your motorbike, especially if you've got a motorbike. But that's another story. I want uh, to simply explain in this passage what Jesus is saying, and that is that he's instructing us on what we ought to fear and what we ought not to fear. And one of the most freeing truths, I think, in the Bible is that once you fear the God of the universe, you need never fear anything else. It's quite a liberating truth. Once you fear God, you can then serve him without fear. Well, in its context, Jesus has just been ripped, ripping into the leadership of the uh, leaders of the church of the time in Israel because of their hypocrisy. Now, last week we picked up on the fact that uh, there's a measure of hypocrisy in every heart. But he's talking about that kind of hypocrisy that consciously lives a double life that is unacceptable. And he gets stuck into them and he says, if you decide to follow me, then you must be prepared to be committed to not being a hypocrite. Uh, an actor, really, with a face mask, to be one thing to the world and another thing inside. Now, I know there's a degree which there's a small H hypocrisy in every one of us because our walk and talk never perfectly lines. But he's talking about an unqualified desire to want to live a life where our inner life bears no resemblance to our outer life. And this kind of mosh pit experience where crowds are sort of jumping all over each other to get to Jesus, he warns them. He says these words, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy that acts like yeast in bread. It makes it grow. Like a, with, we might say like a form of 
uh, vicious cancer that just spreads like wildfire in a body. Left unchecked, it will kill. And the reason Jesus is giving for the warning is this, that it will be exposed. He will not accept anyone who lives that double life and claims his name but has no inner world of desire to follow him. Remember, hypocrisy is living a lie. Being one thing on the outside and another thing on the inside. It's about no concern that your public life bears no relationship to your private life. And what keeps us pretending is that we think we can get away with it. And the cure for hypocrisy is exposure on that final day. Look at verse 2. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. What you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. The God of the universe knows everything. More than that, will reveal everything. Every thought, every word, the imaginations of your hearts. It will be revealed God is committed to truth. Truth about himself, truth about you. God is going public on every private life. Now, can I say, if you're in Christ, uh, you don't have to fear the fact that your sins will come back to condemn you. But there is a real sense that outside of Christ, the exposure is the thing that will condemn you. You know, uh, God is. You know, God, God basically says, "You want, you want a Facebook? I'll Facebook you. On the day of judgment, all the dirt's going to be brought out. And forget about what other people will think; it'll be brought out in His presence. On judgment day, God will keep no secrets. Nothing concealed." Nothing hidden, nothing whispered that will not be revealed, exposed and shouted out from the rooftops. There will be no cover-ups. You know, you may say to Ray Galea, Ray, this is none of your business. This part of my life is none of, none of your business. You can say that to me, but you won't be able to say that to the God of the universe. And yet we play games as though that final day is not a coming. You know, my brother-in-law hates practical uh, tricks played on people and um, especially played on him and he tells a story of a group of friends when they were in England uh, workmates and they decided to play a practical uh, trick on one of the friends one of the guys in the group they were going out to a work lunch and what they did was they knew one of the guys played the same lotto numbers every week and so what they thought they'd do is they'd get in early and say to the uh, the waiter when we ask you for the lotto numbers Tell us these numbers, which were the exact numbers that he always went for. So they're at the, at the work lunch. One of them says, oh, waiter, by the way, you wouldn't know the, the, the numbers for Lotto. Yeah, sure. He pulls out the numbers. They're exactly the numbers that they all know this guy uh, puts in. But he didn't react. He wanted to keep the whole thing a secret. And kind of now, they, they weren't expecting that. It was kind of like they were, they were feeling awkward because he thinks he's won Lotto but won't tell his mates and so they think, well, what do we do now? So they said nothing. <laughs> and that's not where it ended. He, on the basis of that wrong piece of information, he went home, told his wife he'd been having an affair for two years, and said, I'm about to leave you. Now, I don't know about you, but there's a part of me, just a part of me, that wanted to be there when he was finally told those lottery numbers weren't real. There's that instinct within each of us needing a day when the truth will come out. Well, for that man, uh, he didn't have to wait for the day of judgment to expose him. But the problem is not exposure and embarrassment. He'll eventually get over it. I'm sure he has. Verse, not that I commend either the gambling or the practical trip, the trick that was played on him. But verse 5, there's something far worse than being embarrassed by something you've done. Here's what Jesus says, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Oh, so death isn't the worst thing that can happen to you. You understand that, don't you? Death, by a long shot, is not the worst thing that can happen to you. Jesus is now instructing us on the thing you ought to really fear and what you don't have to fear. And what you don't ultimately have to fear, I mean core level fear, is not the guy that can kill you, it's not the cancer diagnosis, and it's not the white pointer off Bondo when you go swimming there. 
It's the fact that there is one who has the right to send you into a place called hell. The thing to fear is not losing the approval of your parents, the respect of your boss, or the love of your friends. It's knowing that there is someone who on the day of judgment has the power to cast you into what Jesus calls the place of utter darkness. That's the one to fear. Hell is not simply the place of the dead. Death is not the end of the story. It's appointed that a man die once and after that face judgment. And Jesus uses graphic language. He even draws on the tip outside of Jerusalem uh, to actually use the images from there to help them understand the kind of the contours of, of the picture of hell. Now, a lot of them are metaphors, word pictures, but they're always referring to a truth. Images of utter darkness where you're completely forsaken relationally. It's where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping because it's painful, gnashing of teeth because rebellion continues. It's the place where the fire does not go out and the worm does not die. It is never ending. Eternal destruction as opposed to eternal life is what's on offer. Imprisonment is another way of describing it. Suffering, pain and rebellion. Uh, this week, uh, if you've been doing Undivided Attention, which is our prayer and Bible reading journaling method, and let me encourage you to do it, the booklets are out in the foyer. Um, the passage designated early this week was 2 Thessalonians 1. Do you remember that, guys? The way in which Paul describes when our Lord Jesus returns. And one of the most graphic elements of that judgment is when, we'll be, when there will be eternal destruction from the face of God. That is, shut out from his presence. That at the core element of hell is severing relationship from the living God. Oh, it's, it's overwhelming if you're outside of Christ. To cry out in hell, where is God? And then to hear those haunting words, God is not here. So, be afraid. Be very afraid. If you're not in Christ Jesus. Now it brings no joy to God to send people to hell. God desires all people to be saved. I hope you know that. God takes no pleasure in the death of anyone. He is glorified in his just judgments, absolutely. But it won't be like when Margaret Thatcher died, the ex -prime, former Prime Minister of England, who got a few people upset about her more conservative policies and there were lots of union strikes and so when she died years later there was much partying going on in northern England and I thought when I was seeing it happen I thought that won't be happening God won't be rejoicing in sending people to hell he takes no pleasure in the death of a sinner now can I say, even if you only think I'm, I, there's a 10% chance that what I'm saying is true, only 10%, you'd want to pursue it, wouldn't you? You must investigate the claims of Christ. The consequences are profoundly serious. Don't be like my friend's sister who died a couple of uh, weeks ago. 800 turned up at the funeral. She was died in her mid-50s. But humanly speaking, she didn't need to die. She, As my friend said, she was afraid of doctors telling her bad news. So she didn't go to the doctors. And the doctor could have treated her for the infection she had. It was a tragic death because someone had kept their head in the sand. These are not idle threats. Hear the words of Jesus. Speak to us. I will, verse 5, again, I will show you whom you should fear. Jesus said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, that's not the thing to fear, has authority to throw you into hell. And then in case you missed it, Jesus says, yes, I tell you, that's for emphasis, fear him. Now, let me be clear. When I became a Christian 33 years ago in the Hotel Bondi, um, that decision was not based primarily on the fear of hell. 
It, that wasn't it. My decision to follow Jesus was based on the fact that when I encountered the claims of Jesus, I was persuaded he was the Son of God. That he was someone I could finally trust with my life. So that when he commented on the reality of hell, he had my attention. Can I say, it's not the fear of hell, it's who Jesus is that determines that when he speaks on an issue, I attend to it. Then I decided to follow Christ. Otherwise, the fear of hell is just words. That Jesus who, just, who we just quoted is the same Jesus who fulfilled over 300 prophecies over 1,300 years, who raised the dead on at least three occasions, who healed every sickness he encountered, who cast out demons, who walked on water, who calmed the storm, who forgave sins, who spoke with authority, who rose on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, who appeared on 10 different occasions after his resurrection in the presence of credible eyewitnesses, who ascended into heaven in the presence of eyewitnesses, who poured out his spirit. It's that Jesus who says, do not worry about your physical death. That's a moment's experience. The thing you need to fear is the one who can cast you into hell itself. Do I have your attention? <laughs> This is a threat you've got to take seriously. But the, then the question is, what does fearing God look like? And he tells you in verse 8, to fear God means to not be ashamed of his son. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the son of man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. To fear God is to not only privately but publicly align yourself with the Lord Jesus. Failure to side with him means he will, he will refuse to side with you on the day of judgment. That's pretty clear. You cannot worship God and not worship his son. Um, picture the day of judgment. Let's call the first lady, a Christian Maria. Maria comes before the throne room of God, before the judgment seat of God and his holy angels. Jesus speaking on behalf of Maria, who loves the Lord Jesus, says, Father, the one in front of you now, Maria, she is mine and she aligned with me and surrendered to me and confessed, not only believed in her heart, but confessed with her mouth that I rose from the dead. And the father will look at Maria and say, Well done, my darling daughter. You have loved my son, therefore you have loved me. Let me now pour out upon you an eternity of love. Well done, good and faithful servant. <coughs> now let's tell a different story. Uh, let's call him Jackie. If there's a Jackie here, I apologise. I just had to choose her. Jackie, refused to accept Christ. Comes before the judgment seat of God as everyone will and before the holy angels on the great judgment day. And the Lord Jesus will not speak on behalf of Jackie. Rather will say, Father, the one in front of you now, Jackie, he is not one of mine. He did not side with me. He did not surrender to me. We are not in relationship. He stands in his own sins. He died in his own sins without forgiveness. And the Father will say to Jackie, I gave you my son and you lived life as though he never came, died and rose again for your forgiveness. Depart from me, I never want to see you again, ever. Hear the promise. Did I get it right? Did that picture capture what's here in verse 8? I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man, that's Jesus, will acknowledge before others the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. Being a Christian is not a private faith experience. Especially if you grew up in the Christian church around the 50s, early 60s, you might have been falsely taught or implied that you could somehow be a private Christian 
Well, whoever told you that was lying to you. They were not quoting the words of Jesus. It's not the main reason for why we baptise, but the, one of the aspects, the important aspects of baptism, sort of, I would say incidental but important aspects of baptism, is that you get to publicly declare your faith. So on Easter Sunday, we'll have a number who will get baptised in the pool here. I encourage you, if you love Jesus, don't keep staying private in your faith. Come and declare your faith. It's why, as we're doing this series, we've decided to actually call on people to enter into formal membership with the church. It's really another way of saying formal discipleship. On the screen, there's a picture of what you've got in your bulletins. Why don't you take it out now and have another look? It's, it's a kind of an official membership drive. I mean, I don't apologise for it. Because we want to draw a circle around those who are saying, yes, I am a disciple of Christ and I'm committing to express my discipleship in this church. The reason why I'm doing it is not for the ones who are committed, it's for the ones who aren't. Because I, I don't want you to get to your deathbed and think, why, not, why didn't I fill out this form? Why did I not respond to Jesus on his terms? Here are 10 marks of membership. Look at number three, a willingness to bear witness to Jesus in both word and deed. The reason why we have that as a mark of membership is because that's a mark of discipleship, as is every one of those 10, and that's found in this verse. So, you may say, that's not me, but that is what I want to be. Then fill it out and make it an expression to say, this is what I want to be like. Fill it out when the, song, when the basket goes out uh, at the last song. You can drop it in there and, uh, and express the fact that, yes, I want to be a member of this church and a disciple of the Lord Jesus and express it in a formal way. But you know what? Now, can I be clear? Not everyone's given the gift of evangelism. Eh? I think... From experience, 5 10% of the church have that. They can't help themselves. They get depressed when they're not evangelising. For the rest of us mere mortals, there's a bit of denying that goes on. Deny oneself and the approval of others so we can put Jesus first and speak a word of witness when that moment comes. But it is part of the deal. It's not only believing in your heart, it's confessing with your mouth. I just can't, you can't go around that issue now you're thinking, well, that's fine, Ray, but I, I get embarrassed about being a Christian and I've been silent when God has opened doors. I've closed them. Is that anyone here? Am I the only one? <laughs> Who'd like to say they really battle to bear witness to Jesus? Who'd like to go public on their fears? I'm going to wait because I reckon it's just good for us. I'm assuming the rest are either not Christians or evangelists. Because that's a normal experience, I think. I haven't met a Christian. I, I've got to be honest, I think there's that weird 5% that just can't help themselves. But for the rest of us mere mortals, we find it really hard. That's why I really get comforted by Peter. Peter who, not that I get comforted by his sin, but I get comforted by the fact that here is Peter asked when Jesus is being interrogated uh, by the high priest three times, three times, not once, but three times, he's asked the question, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? To which he answers in this same gospel, Luke twenty-two fifty-seven, 57, he denied it. Woman, I don't know him. Not once, three times. And I, I'm glad it's kind of written three times. I'm glad it's written and in all four Gospels <laughs> so we wouldn't miss it. Because I know that Peter, this great rock, this first among equals of apostles, right, is found cringing. And by the way, it's not the last time. If you read Galatians, he wimps out again a little bit later when, uh, for fear of man. Three times he feared death more than he feared God and three times we know he was forgiven because this discerning of Jesus isn't a moment experience it's a permanent rejection of Jesus and his words that's what Jesus is describing it's really another way of describing what he says in verse 10 the baptism of the holy the blaspheming of the holy spirit which is unforgivable verse 10 Everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. So the one thing you must never do in your life is blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. You got that clear, right? This is a non there is no forgiveness. Now I guess the upside is it's the only unforgivable sin. Whew. Okay, if I make sure I don't do that, then I know that I can be forgiven for everything else. Okay, that's good to know. That's an important 
Right, there's only one unforgivable sin. Now, Christians have historically tortured themselves over this. I don't know, as a pastor, how many times people have said, Ray, if I haven't done it, I probably could have done it, and I probably will do it. It sounds like, wow, if I make a joke at the expense of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to hell. You know, one small mistake, one hammer on the thumb and, and you curse the holy name of the Holy Spirit and you're gone forever. Like, is that what it's talking about? I don't think so. Again, whenever you read anything in the Bible, put it in its broader context. I spent a little bit of time in the pastor's corner touching on this. But essentially the broader context is, there is Jesus performing miracles, casting out demons, and the religious leaders are accusing him of being in league with Satan. And in the immediate context, it's very clear, isn't it? To blaspheme the Spirit. Well, what is the ministry of the Spirit? Remember, one God, three persons. The Father initiates the plan of salvation. The Son executes the plan of salvation. The Spirit applies the plan of salvation. It's the ministry of the Spirit to take you to Jesus. Jesus himself in Luke, especially in Luke, is the spirit-filled, spirit-led prophet, priest, king who goes to the cross to die for your sins and rise again. So to resist, to blaspheme the spirit is to resist the ministry of the spirit in taking you to Jesus. And not to do it in a moment, but to do it all the way to the point of your death. So for those of you who have heard of the good news of Jesus, well, you've done that today. And you keep on resisting the ministry of the Spirit to take you to Jesus all the way to death. Then understand this, without a shadow of a doubt, you will not be forgiven. I hope that's clear. I don't like saying it, but I have to say it because it's the truth and I love you. You will not be forgiven if you keep on resisting the Spirit's call to take you to Christ. Fear God, stop blaspheming the Spirit, and surrender to Jesus. That's it. That's the point. But if you've come to Jesus, then the good news here is fear God and you can serve him without fear. That's what Zechariah says, uh, the father of John the Baptist, so that we may serve the Lord without fear. Isn't it a funny paradox? Fear God, well, you don't now have to, you come to Jesus, so now you don't have to fear the judgment of God. You live in awe of him, there's a fear of awe and respect and obedience but you're not fearing him as one outside in trepidation, one as with a childlike fear, knowing that he is for you and not against you. Knowing that, and it's, it's liberating this. Once the judge of all the earth has declared you're on his right side because you've surrendered to Christ, then the big questions of life have been solved, which allow you to manage the small questions of life from a very different place. We... Fear the Lord so that we don't have to fear anything else. Now, reality is you're still battling with a quota of fear, are you not? You, you may fear debt or death or divorce. You may fear unemployment or ex exams, sort of small fears. You may fear sickness or being single for the rest of your life. You may feel fear the spirit and the dark kingdom of darkness. You may fear addictions, yours and others. You may fear your children going a certain direction or being harmed. You may fear your parents getting that phone call that they're going to pass away. You may fear some element to do with what people think of you at church. You may fear your neighbours. You may fear your friends. You may fear your enemies. What is it that's driving you? It's good to name it and then to put it under the lens of Jesus' words. Do not fear that. Just fear the one who can cast you into hell. And once you come to him, you don't have to fear hell at all. You know, when I wrote my first book, Nothing in My Hand I Bring, I, had a, I was feeling anxious and I tried to sort of name what the fear was. And can I say, you need to do that as well. Not a bad exercise this week. Try to encapsulate what is the thing that you fear. For me, it was this. I feared that what other people were thinking was this. Here we go. I really thought Ray would do better than that. Do that. 
Now, you might fear, that's not me, I, I just fear being an imposter or I, I fear, you know, the rejection of someone in my life. But for me, that was driving my life. I'm fearing what you're thinking, what the world is thinking, I really thought I'd do better than this. Now, what you've got to work out is you find your sentence that captures your fear and let it surrender to the fear of the Lord, eh? And be set free from it. Because Jesus doesn't want to just liberate you from the fear of hell. He wants you to know that he's with you in your journey from here to eternity. Look at verse 7. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than the many sparrows. Sparrows, they're cheap as chips. Can't get much of a meal out of them. And they used to eat them. They're so cheap you won't even find them in a pet store. And Jesus is saying, if I take care of that which is in the hierarchy of even the animal world is kind of right at the very bottom, right? If I take care of them, do you not think I will take care of you? Of course I will. As you journey in being a disciple of mine. And when it comes time to speaking a word of life, a word of witness to me, even then I will be with you. Verse 11. Last verse. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers and authorities, and clearly in the first instance this is the apostles, do not worry about how you will defend yourself or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at the time what you should say. Isn't that our fear? That we won't have the right words to say when our opportunity comes, when we get to call to give a word of witness, when God opens the door, that I won't give the correct answer, the right answer, that what I say might you know, do more harm than good, that I could set back Christianity a thousand years by saying the dumb thing, the wrong thing at the wrong time. We kind of live in fear and, or I get asked a question, I don't know what the answer is and I ah, freeze up in the moment like a kangaroo in the headlights. Don't you have that fear? And that fear keeps you silent? Trust me, I fear, I feel like the last year I've been wimping out and I hate, especially the last six months, and, you know, God has clearly put on, yeah, I can do this thing. This doesn't scare me that much. It's a little bit scary, but it's not that scary. You know, I, I can look you in the eye and say, fear God who can throw you in hell. I can look you in the eye. I can do that here. But when I'm sitting next to someone in an informal gathering, say with a cousin or a friend, or I'm at a bus stop, you know, and I start a conversation with someone, oh, then Mr. Mr. Confident Galea up here is a little bit chicken there, eh? So I, I fear that, I, I, I got you admitting at the beginning, you're like me and I'm like you, I'm not a natural evangelist. I have to do the work of evangelist as an elder, so I'm paid to do it and I'll be judged for it in a way much stronger than you. But just as, a, as someone who loves Jesus and wants to be obedient to him, I've just let too many opportunities slide by. So I, I feel the urge to go to prayer and maybe join you and have you pray for me and me for you in this prayer. That when God opens those doors, we will not close them, but walk through them and speak a word of life about our glorious Saviour. And in so doing, demonstrate that we're not ashamed of Jesus. Do you think that would be a good prayer to pray? I think so. Why don't you join with me in this prayer? Oh, dear Father, we come to you with a measure of fear. For some of us, it's the fear of death. For others, it's the fear of sickness, the fear of rejection, the fear of failure, the fear of singleness. In some cases, it's the fear of hell itself. And we confess that we mor worry more about what people think than what you think, and that we fear human beings more than we fear God. But Lord, we declare that we trust you, Jesus. We recognise that you will not disown us before the Father on the day of judgement. And so, Father, in light of that truth, we do not want to be ashamed of you before a watching world. But we can't say that without asking for forgiveness. Forgiveness for those many silences those many moments of embarrassment that have grieved you, those times when you did open the door so clearly for us to speak about Jesus and we wimped out and closed the door and for that we're deeply sorry. So I pray for me, Lord, 
and I pray for my brothers and sisters here, please make us bold. Please make us bold and at the same time stop us from being rude in the way we share the Lord Jesus. Please empower us. Help us to trust that by your spirit you will give us the words to say whether it wins the argument or not. But Lord, we don't want to win the argument. We want to win the soul. And for that, we can't even control that's in your hands. So help us to speak a word of life in Jesus' name. Amen.